To say don't worry is something that is going against what our brain does. Our brain will worry. We will have thoughts, but it's changing our relationship with those thoughts and it's picking and choosing which thoughts we listen to and which thoughts we stand up to. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter, candid conversations that count. Existential dread, a sick feeling, a heavy feeling, fear, worrying about terrible things that might happen and feeling like they definitely will. These are just some of the ways that my anxiety presents itself. Although looking back now, I can see that I've suffered from anxiety all my life since I was a little kid. But my realisation came in a very strange way. It all started, oddly enough, with a week at a health retreat. This is where you're meant to go to remedy a health crisis, not trigger one. The regime at the retreat was pretty strict. No sugar, no caffeine, no dairy, no wheat, no alcohol, no soy, no processed foods, and very few carbs. Pretty standard stuff for a health retreat and basically my entire diet, gone, poof. There was no internet or mobile phone use of any kind. We were discouraged from even bringing books, certainly no podcasts. And for the first few days, I absolutely reeled. I was withdrawing from sugar and tea, but withdrawal from connectivity was what I found most brutal. Although the sugar and tea was pretty bad as well. I inhaled Panadol every four hours for the first couple of days to deal with my crippling headaches. But as so often happens when you go to a retreat like this, by day three, I was pretty sort of euphoric. I was drunk on nothing but fresh air and lentils. The meals tasted delicious. The company was enjoyable. And even my chronic addiction to complete sensory stimulation was interrupted. And Much to my surprise, the interruption actually felt like a bit of a relief. So at the end of my time at the health retreat, I actually decided to take this whole life detox home with me and really embrace it fully. I decided I would live a life with minimal stimulation, still no sugar or tea or anything, all the way through my Christmas holidays with my family. It's clear to me now with the benefit of hindsight that this was the most reckless and foolish thing I could ever have done because a few weeks later... I was told that I had had a complete nervous breakdown and that I suffered from a severe form of generalised anxiety disorder. Generalised anxiety disorder, or GAD, it's sometimes called GAD, is a chemical imbalance and it's one that can be treated with medication. I've taken a drug called Lexapro since a couple of weeks after my breakdown, which was about six or seven years ago, and it's changed my life immeasurably for the better. That's not to say there aren't other ways to treat anxiety as well that can also work. Cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, can also be effective for some people and so can regular talking therapy. I've done both and I'm a big fan. And as I've said many times, there are also lifestyle factors that are hugely helpful in managing my anxiety. I exercise every day, I don't drink coffee and I make sure I get lots and lots of sleep. And I don't want you to think I'm being prescriptive about any of this. Everyone's anxiety is different and you have to find the right ways to manage it. But I always make sure that I mention the drugs because I know for some people there's still a real stigma attached to taking medication to treat a mental health issue and I want to help break that down. Lexapro, I love you. And no, before anyone comes at me or ats me, I'm definitely not being paid by a drug company. I just like to share specifically what's worked for me. So you should definitely have a chat with your GP if you're considering medication. Don't take my word for it. But if you do have anxiety, you're certainly not alone. Did you know that one in four adults and one in five children currently suffer from anxiety? And yet two in five people believe the condition is not a treatable mental health illness. When I first read that stat, two in five people believe there's nothing you can do about anxiety, I was really surprised, I guess because I know that it is treatable. But then I realized that I just thought that that's what life was like. I thought that the feelings and the dread that I had and the fears and the constant worrying that I had about things that might happen, I just thought that was normal. I thought that was just life. I thought it was who I was. And my guest today on No Filter is doing a huge amount to change the conversation about anxiety for those like me who have it and for those who probably don't realise that someone in their life, probably lots of people, suffer from anxiety. Anxiety is real, it's treatable, and my guest today, Dr Jodie Lowinger, wants more people to talk about it. 
Jodie is the founder and principal clinical psychologist of the Sydney Anxiety Clinic, and I've wanted to have her on the show for such a long time. Here's my conversation with Jodie. Jodie, let's get some definitions out of the way. What's the difference between stress and anxiety? That's a fantastic question, and it's one that I get asked quite often. It does potentially come down to semantics, some comes down to labels. I tend to talk about stress more in a particular point in time. So if we've got a lot of priorities, a lot of pressing deadlines, mm. we might feel this level of stress, which is the adrenaline pumping through our system. And to a large degree or to a certain degree, that actually drives us forward and Mm. keeps us engaged and motivated. And so we can embrace that stress and say, I need to get my job done. I need to look after the kids. I need to juggle all of these things. And I'm in the zone. I'm pumped to engage in that. So that's potentially a level of adrenaline in our bloodstream that keeps us fired up and keeps us on the game. So where it tips more into something like anxiety is what our point of focus is. And so anxiety is a physiological reaction to perceived threat in our environment. Mm -hmm. So when we're stressed, we might be fired up and focused on getting our job done effectively. We are focused on things that are aligned to our values, let's say, aligned to what gives us a sense of purpose. When we are experiencing anxiety, we might be more focused on fear or something bad happening Mm. that can tip us over the edge and tip that adrenaline and cortisol in our bloodstream to a level that doesn't work in our favour. So when I had to go and see an expert about my anxiety when I had a breakdown after an 11-day panic attack, he was explaining it to me that in me, it's a, and in some people, it's like almost a malfunction of the fight or flight response. Mm. So in most people, that's a life-saving instinct that we have. Mm. Like if there's approaching danger or if we sense danger, mm. either existential danger or real physical danger, it's usually meant for, we have this release of adrenaline and we're ready to fight or flee. Mm. But for me, I experienced it when I was in my lounge room having a cup of tea and there Mm. was no danger except for the perceived danger in Mm. my mind. Is that what anxiety is? Almost a fear of something happening? Yeah, that's a really beautiful way to describe it. It can be a sensitized, it's the part of the brain called the amygdala. It's the amygdala is kind of the control center to what we call the fight or flight reaction, as Mm. as you said. So this fight or flight reaction is our instinctive mechanism that keeps us motivated or primed to survive. And it's been with us for ever since the dawn of humankind. Running away from dinosaurs. Running away from dinosaurs. So it's this physiological reaction to threat in our environment. And the fight is I've got to attack, I've got to defend. And the flight is I've got to get Mm. out of there. I've got to run away. And that's where our brain is phenomenal because it gives us this instinctive reaction to survive in times of real threat. Where it can be problematic is that our brain is not necessarily so good at differentiating between real threat, the saber-toothed tiger, and perceived threat, Mm. which is perhaps a worry thought. So an individual might have a worry thought that might even be a fleeting worry thought, but it triggers this fight or flight reaction. So it might be as simple as, What if I make a mistake or what if that dog is going to bite me or what if this sensation in my body means that I've got a tumour? So it tips us into this hijacking amygdala, this flight or flight reaction, Mm. and the brain is programmed to be hijacked by that part of our brain, by the amygdala, which gets us then focused in on our threat. 
it makes sense if we wanted to、mm. run away from a threatening situation that we don't want to be thinking about what we're going to make for dinner that night or what we're doing on the weekend. We want to be focused on our threat, and that's called hypervigilance to threat. And these are all a primitive survival instinct at play. And so all of a sudden we're focused in on our threat, which then exacerbates that fight or flight reaction, and it turns into this problematic feedback loop. For some people, and I know in myself, sometimes I can't even identify what it is.、Mm. Sometimes I might be sitting in the lounge room drinking my cup of tea. My body is reacting as though I'm being chased around my house、mm. by an intruder. Yes, but I can't even pin it. To a particular thought or a particular worry,、mm. is that generalized anxiety where it's not anchored to any one thing, but it just what's that? So what that might be, or it sounds like, is there is a biological underpinning to anxiety. I see it all the time in in the clinic. Is that oftentimes or predominantly there is a family history of anxiety.、Mm. So this may well be that certain individuals might have a more sensitised amygdala that it's more quick to fire. So that might be that biological underpinning, and I know that there's some powerful research being done, particularly with that and looking at neuro、uh, neurochemical mechanisms. So it can be hereditary. Yeah,、uh, it seems to be, and there's a lot of different theories out there, but certainly in my Experience、mm. with many individuals, many, many, many individuals who are experiencing anxiety. There does seem to be some sort of a family predisposition, so a hereditary or genetic predisposition that creates a bit of a sensitised reaction,、mm. and that might also be just this more vigilant, more aware of the consequences. A deep, a, a, an analytical mind, let's say, and. A level of care and well-being. So, oftentimes the individuals who I work with do have this deep sense of empathy, as I mentioned. So they might be thinking more about the consequences of actions or thinking about the future. And sometimes it can just feel like an automatic reaction, like a speed dial from the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of our brain, to that more instinctive, emotional part of our brain, the amygdala. And what about health anxiety? I know that's been something I've suffered from and still do suffer from,、mm. and it seems to be a type. Is it a type of anxiety, health anxiety, or is it just that your worry has to hook onto something? It's interesting because we've got these diagnoses: health anxiety as one, or illness anxiety. And I love what you said: is that does your worry just have to hook onto something? And that's my take: is that this is something that perhaps. That worry, I, I, I personify worry. I talk about the worry bully bossing us around, and that we can notice and notice the story that worry tells us. And sometimes that story tends to repeat itself. And this perhaps is that particular story that is repeating itself in your situation. But the underpinning of this is a fear of uncertainty. A fear、mm. of uncertain situations, and I know having heard some of your your personal story, is that there have been times where you've been af- afraid of flying,、mm. and and this health anxiety that's played out in your situation, the underpinning is actually quite similar. It might just be that worry is taking on this personality that it's decided to boss you around in flying, or it's decided to boss you around in in health situations. But the core fear there is uncertainty about what if something bad happens, and there are tends to be three big ticket items in that. It sometimes is around health because、mm. there's un- a lot of uncertainty with health, and perhaps even the flying is is health related because、yeah. it's what if something bad happens to me physically? Yeah. Or it might be in performance situations. So, what if I stuff up? What if I make a mistake? And that drives perfectionism in that. And then it is sometimes in social situations. What if I'm judged negatively? So they're the three big ticket items in relation to uncertainty that can play out. Often, it's high functioning individuals who really deeply care to do well. And so, how I differentiate where it's tipping us into an 
unhelpful or mm. an unhealthy headspace is if we're being bossed around by fear mm. and letting worry get in the way and so we are defensive against fear as opposed to what's in our heart our values and being pulled towards something that gives us a sense of meaning and purpose in which it drives us that adrenaline drives us forward rather than being pushed away from a threat so those three different types of anxiety I guess that you talked about was mm. around health and mm. I guess safety comes into that. So a fear yeah. of death really. Yes. Performance related and social. Yeah. Social anxiety is something that we're a lot more aware of than we used to and sort of people talking quite openly about being introverted. How does social anxiety manifest itself? So one of the core fears with social anxiety is fear of being judged negatively or fear of not being good enough in some way. So social and performance anxiety are kind of subsets of each other. Uh, performance anxiety probably a subset of social anxiety. And it's actually something I see really commonly in the practice. It's tough in society now because we are oftentimes projecting our airbrushed selves on social mm -hmm. media and seeing what everybody's doing and seeing everybody else's airbrushed selves. So it's creating an unrealistic expectation, this compare and despair or fear of missing out. And that is really tough. So it really feeds the beast of social anxiety and not being good enough. And also just the society that we live in with technology, which don't get me wrong, technology is phenomenal and I you know, I'm very much part of this, but it goes against our biological predisposition. We were, we were designed to roam in fields and to pick berries off the trees. So, you know, we aren't, we're living in a world that is out of alignment with our biological state. So social anxiety is certainly exacerbated mm. by the the contemporary world that we live in. Some people would say, oh, we're over medicalizing everything now. And social anxiety used to just be called being shy. What's the difference between being shy or being antisocial and having social anxiety? So I work with many human beings who are not shy, but experience social anxiety. So social anxiety can be a shy person who experiences social anxiety but it doesn't have to be. I work with many elite athletes, for example, mm. or people that are in the entertainment industry uh, and have to put their face out there all the time. So they are certainly not shy, but they might experience social anxiety. And in fact, a lot of people that are in the public arena experience social anxiety. And it's a double-edged sword because on one hand, this element of social anxiety propels them to be the very, very best that they can be, but it's driven by fear potentially and not mm. driven by values. If it's driven by fear, it can feed this perfectionism which says I'm only good enough if I'm perfect and that sets up a challenging spiral or feedback loop again where there's no such thing as perfection. So they're striving for the potentially unattainable it might keep them moving forward and facilitate brilliance, but it is underpinned by anxiety. Mm. So that's the difference. It, it doesn't have to be shyness. It can be something that's quite different from that. I remember when I was first diagnosed and I didn't know anyone, I thought I didn't know anyone who had anxiety in a similar way to when I had a miscarriage, I thought I didn't know anyone who'd experienced that either. Yeah. When I started talking about it, I was shocked at how many people said, me too, me mm. too, me too, me too. And that mm. still happens to this day when I speak about it quite openly, which I make a deliberate choice to do. Mm. The shame and stigma still exists. And I think anxiety can be quite invisible. And for many people, probably many people listening to this, they won't realise that what they have is anxiety. Mm -hmm. How is it that you can know that it is anxiety? It's not stress. It's not a busy time. It's not a phase you're going through. It's not PMT or PMS. It's actually anxiety. How can you tell? You can be human. 
<laughs> so what I mean by that is I am really big on helping people to not feel a sense of shame if they experience let's say more extreme anxiety because I tend to think that to be anxious is really part of our core humanity because we are inbuilt with this fight or flight reaction. Mm. So when I'm speaking with individuals or with the media, I tend to conceptualise anxiety as not a weakness. It can actually drive strength But where it tips into something that is a problem is if it is causing that fear, suffering and avoidance in a person's life. Fear, suffering and avoidance. Tell me about avoidance. Avoidance is a hallmark feature often of anxiety. Uh, It, again, uh, anxiety being a physiological reaction to perceived threat to a worry thought. And worry might say that something bad is going to happen in a particular situation. And so worry might tell us avoid that situation. It's like, why would we want to expose ourselves to a saber-toothed tiger? So it can be something that's deeply threatening, but it's our perception of threat. So I won't travel because I'm scared of flying. I won't say yes to this invitation to go out to drinks with my colleagues because I find that too difficult a situation to be in. I won't put up my hand for that promotion because I don't think I'll be able to get through the job interview. Are they the kinds of things you mean? Spot on. Absolutely right. And there's different levels of avoidance. These are what's called safety behaviours. So safety behaviours are unhelpful coping strategies. They're things that are triggered in our lives that are Mm fear-driven rather than values-driven. What do you mean by that? So if we... Can you give me an example? Yeah. So a safety behaviour might be checking and rechecking our work. Or our front door to make sure it's locked. Or our front door to make sure it's locked. Absolutely. So safety behaviours can be really subtle. It might be carrying a bottle of water around everywhere just in case my voice gets dry or something like that. But it doesn't have to be rational. It can be quite irrational. Seeking reassurance is a safe, a common safety behaviour, but avoidance is a, a really typical safety behaviour. It's The things that we engage in because we don't want something bad to happen. So you go, you don't go through the tunnel, you go a different way to work because you you get anxiety around going through a tunnel or you stop driving because you're anxious about what if you get in a car accident, is that? That's exactly right. And the problem with this, worry worry tricks us in several different ways. Worry says that something bad is really likely to happen, that it's going to be really awful, that you're not going to cope. And it's really hard to ignore that worry voice that's playing out. Some people have got a really loud worry voice. And when we listen to it, we avoid naturally. We don't want something bad to happen, so we listen to it. The problem with this is we fail to build up resilience Or more so, we don't allow ourselves to learn that worry was wrong, that nothing bad happened. So we let worry make our lives smaller. Exactly. Our lives close in and then we lose that confidence to face it. And then we're out of alignment with what gives us a sense of meaning and purpose and joy and satisfaction in life. We're being bossed around by fear and bossed around by anxiety. It's where vigilance Mm. turns into hypervigilance. So we are seeking out threats rather than just doing what's prudent risk-taking behaviour. But, I mean, the anxiety in me would say, but Jody, bad things do happen. We have mass shootings. People get cancer. People get involved in accidents. Planes do crash. How do you synthesize that with saying, don't worry, don't become hypervigilant? To say don't worry is something that is going against what our brain does. Our brain will worry. We will have thoughts but it's changing our relationship with those thoughts and it's picking and choosing which thoughts we listen to and which thoughts we stand up to. And now this isn't easy. None of this is easy, particularly if we do have a really sensitized amygdala or a you know, really incredible 
thinking mind that tends to overthink and play over time about all of the possible scenarios. So it really is about starting to become aware of some of the helpful thought processes and some of the unhelpful thought processes and recognizing, is this taking me away from moving forward in, I I differentiate between our head and our heart. Is this taking me away from what my heart is telling me that I want to do? Or is this taking me in line with that? So it's almost like a two-pronged approach. It's about awareness of what fear is doing and awareness of what we deeply want to do in life. It's also the difference between vigilance, as I mentioned, and hypervigilance is am I taking measured risks or am I being bossed around by worry that is getting in the way of me living my life. So this is not about positive thinking. This is not about denying the fact that the world is filled with dangerous situations and possibilities, but this is about saying, let's sit with the discomfort of uncertainty rather than do our head in to try and get certainty when there is no certainty. Right. So it's almost like because the uncertainty is so uncomfortable, your brain goes, let's just behave as though it's definitely, this bad thing's definitely going to happen. Like I used to explain to people that when I'm in a plane, or used to be this way, when I was in a plane and the plane would land, I would be so shocked because I would genuinely have spent the whole flight and all the time preceding it just knowing that it was going to crash. And so it genuinely would come as a surprise, a wonderful surprise Mm. and a relief when it didn't crash. Mm. But you're saying you almost have to be comfortable with the fact that the plane might crash, but it really probably isn't going to. That's highly unlikely. It's about recognising that reassurance is actually going to feed the beast. Giving ourselves reassurance doesn't actually really help because there's always going to be that uncertainty. Mm. There's always going to be that small percentage, even if it's the what if m- minuscule. Yeah, it's not an aeroplane problem that we have here. It's an uncertainty problem, and when we grapple with uncertainty and we fight and fight and fight to get certainty when there is none, we're keeping ourselves in the fight or flight headspace. <sighs> We're keeping our amygdala ignited. So it is very much about... So what do you do? You get out of the boxing ring. I thought you were going to say you get out of the plane. I'm like, (laughs) come on, it's in the air. You You get get out of the boxing ring. You get out of the boxing ring. You're fighting uncertainty. When you're never going to have certainty. You can't win. You can't win that. So, So what do you do instead? You make friends with uncertainty. And you make friends with worry. And I know that all of this is so easy to say and so challenging to do. And this is where we work together to help people through it. But what what I really want to encourage people is to recognize that anxiety is so treatable. Mm. It is so helpable. I don't know that that's a word, but I use it often. <laughs> it's so helpable because it's about understanding our brain and understanding that it's not a weakness. It is just our brain doing what our brain was pre-programmed to do. And maybe we do have a bit more of a sensitization to that. Sometimes life experience also triggers that sensitization. We might have had a traumatic life experience, which does create a bit of a speed dial in certain situations to that fight or flight reaction. But it is about understanding mental processes, understanding ourselves, raising awareness, because we can only change what we're aware of in the first place. Where does medication fit in? Because some people think that the only way to treat anxiety is with medication. I take medication. I take Lexapro. And I was nervous about starting medication, partly because of, I don't know, I I don't know if I felt that there was stigma, but just nervous. Just it seemed like a quite a big deal. I've never looked back and I'm just so thrilled Mm. to be on my medication. I love my Lexapro so much. Yeah. Is that an answer for a lot of people, some people? It's probably an answer for some people 
and it is certainly an answer for some people. So the, the science says that for more extreme anxiety, even moderate, moderate to extreme anxiety, the evidence says that an antidepressant medication alongside psychological or clinical psychological interventions can be phenomenally helpful. I was confused when I was first prescribed Lexapro because it is an antidepressant, but mm. it is designed for people with anxiety. Spot on. And I thought, well, but I'm not depressed. Why mm. do I need an antidepressant? So the antidepressant helps to take the edge off those spiralling thoughts and uh, it allows an an individual to engage in psychological interventions because sometimes it can be too extreme. It can be terrifying to do these sorts of things. And so there is certainly a time and place for medication. Mm. Uh, So in those situations, it would be a clinical psychologist working alongside a medical specialist who would prescribe the medication that might be a GP or a psychiatrist. Uh, and to ensure that the right medication is prescribed for that individual. And if someone doesn't want to go on medication or medication is not suitable for them because their anxiety isn't extreme enough, what are some of the other things that they can do? Like cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, is that something? Absolutely. So I would consider myself a bit of a hybrid therapist. I'm I'm very I'm a holistic therapist. So I would embrace evidence-based treatment strategies. So that would be CBT or acceptance and commitment therapy, or there are several other evidence-based modalities. Changing the way you think about things. Changing the way you think about things, uh, looking at the nature of thought processes and helpful versus unhelpful thought processes, and looking at what is important to a human being, what gives them a sense of meaning and purpose. But we also uh, recognise the power between the mind and the body connection. So really anxiety is very responsive to looking after your body to look after your mind. So exercise is Mm. one of the best therapists there is. I will be the first person to say that, that exercise, so long as it's driven not by fear of not being good enough or body image kind of things, but so long as it's really looking at helping with quietening that hijacking amygdala, it can be really powerful, eating well, and getting good sleep, but being imperfect in this. I talk about purposeful imperfection because a lot of the people who I work with are quite perfectionistic. So some of these strategies, they can think, oh my goodness, but I'm not going to be good enough. (laughs) I'm not going to get my 10 hours or eight hours of sleep. I've failed. Exactly. Exactly. So I want, when I'm helping people or working with people, I really want people to sit more comfortably with being imperfect in treatment (laughs) as well. And sometimes we do what's called behavioural experiments. It's actually purposefully being imperfect and that can be really helpful as well. So the mind-body connection is really important. Looking at Uh, strategies that help to quieten that hijacking amygdala. So sometimes it's meditation. But again, I talk about purposeful imperfection with this because uh, best practice would say with meditation would be to do two lots of 20 minutes a day. And busy people who are a lot of the people who I work with, CEOs, senior executives, um, I work with all ages, adults, children and, and adolescents, but I do work with many people, executive teams in organisations And oftentimes there is this perfectionism that can play out and can get in the way. And oftentimes we're not going to be able to get our eight hours sleep. Um, You know, I'd be the first person to put my hand up and say, you know, I don't. (laughs) But we can strive towards that and uh, and look at what best practice is Mm. and, you know, recognize that there is power behind that. There is power behind being evidence based in treatment for anxiety. It would then be looking at standing up to worry and strategies in that it would be slowly and compassionately approaching avoided situations, recognising that sometimes this can be really terrifying. So it is about the individual who I'm working with to have ownership of that problem. It's very collaborative in helping people, but we test it out. We take Mm. on a scientific approach and prove time and time again that worry was just full of rubbish. Mm, mm. <laughs> um, that idea of standing up to the worry bully. Yeah, exactly I like right. that. You mentioned sleep and exercise. 
for me, the third part of that trifecta is routine. Yes. And I'm now for the first time, I can't believe, linking it back to what you said about uncertainty. The thing about routine is that it provides certainty. It provides that bedrock of certainty. Mm. Is that why it can play such a role in helping to manage anxiety? Absolutely. But there's a fine line between whether it's feeding the beast or whether it's helping. Mm. So there's many faces of anxiety. It's really idiosyncratic. So what I mean by that is that what works for somebody might not work for another Mm. person. So it's only a problem if it's a problem. And if this is helping in your situation, then it's brilliant. Then embrace it, love it. If it keeps you at a way that enables you to get on with your life in a phenomenal way, then love it. But if it becomes a prison. Exactly. And it's like your coping mechanism then becomes almost part of your avoidance strategy. So that if anything out of your routine is completely freaking you out, well, Mm. then that's not helpful, is it? Potentially. Potentially. What about anxiety in children and adolescents? You know, the statistics say one in four adults, one in five children, Mm. you know, so many friends of mine who've got adolescents and kids who have anxiety. Has it always been this way or is it technology? I mean, it feels like an epidemic. Yeah, I mean, this is a really powerful question around has it always been this way and the epidemic of anxiety. Uh, It comes back to the world that we live in, the technology, the being addicted to our phones and what that impacts on our children and adolescents' well-being and uh, resilience because sometimes this feeds fear of not being good enough. It feeds not being able to separate from it and not having any downtime. It feeds not having enough sleep and just this sense of being constantly wired. And constantly on, on display, performing. Yeah. There's also exposure to content that is out of alignment with what our children might actually be ready to hear or see. What do you mean by things they're not ready to see? Do you mean exposure to porn? Do you mean exposure to violent content? Is it just that the internet is choose your own adventure and they're seeing all kinds of things that in previous generations we would never have been able to access? Yeah, it's all of those sorts of things. It's porn, it's violence. Sometimes, you know, you can research everything and ed- anything. So there is sometimes even a desensitization to mental health stuff. You know, there's so much to it that's powerful and important and this capacity to research and to, to be informed is really great. However, boundaries and restrictions around that with our children and with our adolescents are really important. It comes back to parents, just building an environment where there is open communication because the fact is they will be exposed to this sort of stuff. And it's how can we create opportunities to connect with our children and keep those communication lines open to be able to recognise what they are being exposed to and to have the answers in effective ways. If you're a parent and you're worried that your child seems to have anxiety, what are some of the signs? So anxiety can present itself, as I mentioned, in many different ways. And oftentimes with little ones and with teenagers and and with adults as well, it can be agitation. It can actually be oppositional behaviour and naughtiness or playing up at home, at school. So often these sorts of things can be masked anxiety. Sometimes it's distractibility. Sometimes it's inattentiveness. So I get many times misdiagnoses and uh, we underpin what's going on and we identify that it's anxiety and we treat the anxiety. And this has the power to turn young lives around because a child who is experiencing anxiety. You know, we talked about shyness earlier. Mm. 
it's only one face of anxiety. So with kids, it is sometimes hard to unravel the anxiety that's going on because children don't necessarily know what's going on themselves. We have a capacity as adults to recognize anxiety, whereas children might just be getting caught up in some of the physiological stuff that's going yeah. on. Sometimes complaints might be um, a child saying that they've got tummy aches or that they don't want to go to school in the morning or that they don't want to go to sleep at night or it's impacting on their sleep. They might be having bad dreams or it's avoidance playing up. All of these sorts of things are possible, mm, indicators. possible indicators. It might not be anxiety. It might be something completely different. So if someone's listening to this and they don't know what to do, they may be recognising, oh, I think maybe I have anxiety. I think maybe my child, my teenager, my partner, my friend might have anxiety. What's the first thing to do if you think that, that you might be suffering from it? The first thing to do is to treat yourself with kindness and compassion and care. You know, I talked about trying to be perfect women as well mm. as men we're all trying to be perfect and we are trying to be everything to everyone women with jobs with home with jobs at home with children we feel like our own needs we push them under the carpet and this might be one of them we deny ourselves the right for self-compassion and kindness so it is really about checking in on what our needs are, to look within and say, this is, this is hurting me right now and I deserve to seek help in whatever way that might be. And as we talked about earlier, if help for you means doing exercise, if that helps with your mental health, recognise those needs. If help for you means I need to talk with someone, I need strategies, I don't know what to do, I feel help helpless and out of control. Mm. It's recognising that the strategies are out there. It's seeking out practitioners who engage in evidence-based treatment. Sci what that means is scientifically supported treatment that is demonstrated to work. Don't go to an energy healer and think that's going to fix it. Well, that would be my advice. I think some <laughs> people are like, I just need to go to yoga. And I mean, that could be part of it. And maybe that will work for you. But there are certain people and I'm one of them. I needed more. I needed therapy and I needed medication. So if you do feel that you need more, do you see your GP? Do you Google psychologist anxiety? What, what are the practical things that you do to take that next step? Uh, a GP is a brilliant first point of contact. A GP is often a really powerful, fabulous gatekeeper of an individual's care, mm. particularly if there are multidisciplinary approaches that are required. And GPs are so knowledgeable and brilliant. So they, they might be able to help in and of themselves. However, if they feel that a, a clinical psychologist is warranted, um, then that can be powerful as well. I also find GPs are really good referrers. So particularly if you're in a practice, so for example, I'm in a practice where there's lots of women, there's lots of, as patients, there's lots of kids. If I, they're the ones that are seeing people all day, every day. And a lot of people have anxiety. So mm. if you say, I think I want to see a psychologist, mm. I, you know, I'm, here's the kind of person I'm looking for, or here's the specialist, specialist area that I'm looking for. They'll have referrals. You don't just necessarily have to go to Google. No, exactly. We we are so fortunate that there, you know, I love the power of sisterhood particularly yeah. and just connection, connecting mm. with others and reaching out to others and, and just allowing yourselves the conversations to lead by example in opening up conversations, in being there for one another, in taking judgment out of it and leading by example, uh, whatever side of the table you're on, if we can connect and help and support one another and, and allow people to acknowledge that it's not weak to feel, that is super powerful. Jody, thanks so much. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me here. Good to see you after all these years. I know, right? How good is that? Amazing. <laughs> 
I hope you found that helpful, whether you experience anxiety or not. Speaking with Jodie, I just found so interesting. And this idea of the worry bully by being bullied by worrying thoughts. I've thought about that so many times since we've done our interview because just because I take my medication and do other things and have my anxiety pretty much under control, it doesn't mean that occasionally it doesn't break through. Particularly hormones can affect it, I find. So I've found myself really going back to what she said about the worry thoughts bullying you and sometimes I'm like, yeah, stop bullying me, worry thoughts. If you are struggling though, the first thing to do is to make an appointment with your GP. They have these conversations all day, every day. So if you want to talk about medication or if you're just finding your life a bit unmanageable and you're struggling, go to your GP. That's a great first port of call. If you want to read more about anxiety, head on over to mamamia.com.au where this week we are running an anxiety capsule series, which means we've got loads of written content about anxiety. And if you want to hear more from Dr. Jodie Lowinger, you can find out more about her at the sydneyanxietyclinic.com. No Filter is produced by Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman. Hang in there if you're suffering from anxiety. I know it's not easy, but you're not alone. And I'll see you on Mamma Mia.